In this video, we're going to go and uh, take a look at some more consequences of the fact that the speed of light in a medium is slower than the speed of light in a vacuum. What you're seeing here is an example of what's called total internal reflection. You can see the light coming in from the source. It's going through a piece of plastic. There's no um, refraction we're speaking of right at this surface because we're coming straight in, so the angle of incidence is zero. Then we hit right here to the interface. Now this is a situation where when the, uh, the angle of incidence is steep enough that if you calculate the angle of refraction here, since light would want to bend away from the normal, it turns out that this is a case where you would end up taking an arc sine of a number bigger than 1. If you try doing that and you put it into your calculator, you'll get some variant on tilt. And this makes sense because there is no real number that you can take the sine of and end up with a number bigger than 1. Fortunately, it turns out in a treatment beyond the scope of this course, that as the angle of incidence gets bigger and bigger, the intensity of the light gets weaker, of the refracted light gets weaker and weaker. And it turns out that when you get right to this angle where everything would go tilt, or you would require an angle of refraction of 90 degrees, that right at that point, the intensity of the light drops to zero and this is also the case for any angle of incidence steeper than this so-called critical angle. So then all the light winds up reflecting off of the surface and, um, and none of it refracts. Okay. So we're in here, our medium N1 here has an index greater than the medium N2 on the other side of the surface. Um, you can go ahead and strike a normal here. So it's a right angle. So if we're coming, so when we come in at some angle of incidence, remember here, because N2 is less than N1, we're going to refract away. So we're going to look for this critical angle, it's called, where if we were to refract, the angle of refraction would be 90 degrees. Now at this exact point, the intensity is actually equal to zero, so you wouldn't see any light at this point. But this is, but if we come in shallower than this, there will be refracted light of some intensity or other. If we come in steeper than this, there will be no refracted light. And the law of reflection still applies. So whatever light is coming in at the critical angle, or if we're coming in steeper, that angle, will have to go out at that same angle. OK, so let's figure out what that angle is. So we can use Snell's law say n1 sine theta 1 is equal to n2 sine theta 2. In this case, our theta 1 is our critical angle, and our n2, our, our um, theta 2 here, is going to be 90 degrees. But the sine of 90 degrees is 1. So we can write that the sine of the critical angle is N2 over N1, and the critical 
angle then is the inverse sine of n2 over n1. So to make this concrete, let's take a look for the case of if we were bouncing glass, um, if we were bouncing um, light off of uh, glass, let's say ground glass. Our critical angle here would be the arc sine of, well, our N2 is air, and our, so that will be an index of 1, and our N1, the glass that um, we're coming from the inside of, is going to be 1.5. Two, three. Okay, so let's go ahead and calculate that. So 1.523, 1 over arc sine, 41 degrees. So if you come in an angle steeper than just a shade over 41 degrees, in crown glass, then you will have total internal reflection. This actually gets used in applications like binoculars or in uh, single lens reflex cameras where they have what's called a pentaprism. Um, but binoculars are probably the easier case to look at. In binoculars, the problem is, is that the lenses of the binoculars pretty much because of the optics involved, have to be spaced wider than your eyes actually are. So you need to somehow pipe the light over to your eyes. What happens is that each of these corners here, like let's look at this corner right here, at this corner right here, you stick in a prism. And this will be a 90, 45, 45 prism usually. So the light comes in, it comes in square on this prism and mostly passes through. And with clever use of coatings, you can encourage most of the light to go through. But the important bit is it then, whoops, it then strikes right there. And we can erect a normal right there. And the deal is we're coming in at 45 degrees. That angle is steeper than the critical angle. So that means all the light gets reflected off of that surface and over to the next prism. Okay. Another fun result that I don't know where else to put it, so I will go ahead and put it here is Brewster's angle. It's uh, the derivation of it is beyond the scope of this course. It involves solving what's called the Fresnel equation for the reflected light. It comes from a consideration of how the electric fields have to get propagated off of the surface of the interface. But let's say you have, well, we can make it unpolarized light for our purposes here. Let's say you have unpolarized light, oops, let me, coming in say, an, I don't know, an angle like this or something. 
So this will be, say, air. Doesn't matter what it is. Just as long as this index is greater than that index. If you come in at a certain very special angle, which we'll call Brewster's angle, it turns out that at this particular angle, we'll go ahead here, here's our refracted ray. It turns out that at this very special angle, the reflected and the refracted rays make a right angle. And if you have, say, unpolarized light coming in on the surface, the light that reflects off of the surface will be completely horizontally polarized. This light here will not be, it will only be partially vertically polarized. So basically no vertically polarized light can reflect off of, can reflect if it's coming in at this angle. All the vertically polarized light has to pass through and However, some of the horizontally polarized light will also pass through into the refracted ray, but what reflects off will be totally horizontally polarized. So this is a way that you can make polarized light other than using a, a Polaroid. And um, this is why, th this is one of the motivating factors for making polarized glasses, in fact. Because if this material here is, say, water or it's glass, um, if it's water, you know, say you're on a boat or something like that, you have all this water that's, horizon that, that's horizontal. And the, uh, I should probably more carefully say, pull parallel to surface. And this is perpendicular to surface. You have all this light that's coming in from the sun and the glare that reflects off turns out that a lot of it will be at angles around Brewster's angle um, if, when the glare is really bad. And so even if it isn't totally polarized parallel to the surface, it's got a good chunk. So a judicious use of polarizers in your glasses will help take all that glare off of the water and you can see into the water. Same thing if you're driving. Um, <clears throat> windows on houses and storefronts especially are oriented vertically. In this case, the light reflecting you get the case of light reflecting off of the glass. Again, you'll be coming in at angles very close to Brewster's angle. And the so the light will be polarized parallel to that surface, which would be vertical in this case. And um, so again, with a judicious choice of sunglasses, you can block that out. Since the people who design polarized sunglasses don't know whether you're worried about blocking glare for um, water coming off of a lake, or if you're looking for blocking glare for light, lit light coming off of a storefront window, um, what they usually do is they set the uh, angles to, of the polarizers to 45 degrees on your eyes. That way they at least block out some of the light and make the they're tolerable. And we can again do this, let's say for crown glass. Um, so if we calculate Brewster's angle for crown glass here, um, this will be the arc tan. Turns out that the Brewster's angle is always the arc tangent of n2 over n1. 
And so if we do this for crown glass and air, we get that this would be the arc tangent of 1.523 over 1, which is 56.7 degrees. So if you're being on a lake or something like that, this is like that. This would correspond to sunrise-ish, sunset-ish type angles, or at least in the neighborhood. And so having, so there'll be a fairly healthy component polarized um, parallel to the lake. And so polarized sunglasses can help to knock a lot of that out. Okay, next thing that I'm wanting to get into is dispersion. So here, you can see again, Light is coming in. This, this is a fairly steep angle. Here you can see some of the reflected light, but we're still at a point where most of it is being refracted. Or, well, actually at this point, most of it is being refracted. Um, but notice here how the colors, how, how the light is spreading out. And I zoomed in more carefully on the right here. You can see over here on the side that's closer to the normal, is red light, and on the side farther away from the normal is blue light. And you don't see the rest of the spectrum in between because you're actually kind of looking at a, an overlapping of colors, and so it'll still add up to white in the middle. But you get this red edge on the left and this blue edge on the right, at least. If this were an absolutely razor thin slit, then yes, you would actually see a pretty little spectrum um, running from red all the way through violet. But here, reds, blues. And I want you to notice that the blue is bending through a bigger angle. Oops, there we go. So, To set the stage of this historically, let's go back to the time of Newton when people were figuring out the nature of light in the first place. The big puzzle was what was white light, or maybe the better way to put it is what was colored light. Um, there were two major competing hypotheses. One that was seemingly very sensible was that, say, was that most people noticed that the way that you made light was you shined it through, say, something like stained glass or something like that, and then you had white light coming in and, say, red light or blue light or whatever coming out the other side of the stained glass. So it seemed reasonable to say that you were somehow adding um, the color of the stained glass to the white light, sort of like the white light was a blank canvas and you were adding color. So that was one hypothesis. The other hypothesis is one that uh, Newton thought was more reasonable, was that uh, the that white light was actually all the colors, and that when you shine something, say light through, say stained glass or something like that, what it did was it filtered out all the colors except for a few, and then that made the shade that you saw by going through the glass. And it was really hard to come up with a way to test this, but Newton did. Um, at the heart of this was, again, going back to a prism. And this time, let's go look at, say, more like an equilateral triangle. Ooh, sorry about that. More like an equilateral triangle type prism. So I'm going to try. So. All these angles here should hopefully all be 
basically the same. We'll say 60 degrees. Okay. So if we have light coming into a prism, like so, oops. We can go ahead and strike a normal to where it hits. There we go. And we know that that light would have to bend toward the normal there. So we'll do that. Whoops. Something like that, let's say. Now here, when it hits that surface, it'll have to bend away from that normal. So you wind up coming out at the end of this all, having been twisted through a pretty decent angle. And similar to what I showed in the photo, um, Newton observed the same kind of thing happening, that the uh, blue light seemed to be going through a bigger bend than the red. Now, this was not in and of itself um, conclusive that the uh, light um, was, that white light was made of all the colors. Um, it could certainly be argued that maybe just something about the structure of the glass somehow added color or whatever. So Newton came up with the idea of putting two of these prisms in sequence. So if you've seen the in interior of the album, not the CD of Pink Floyd, Dark Side of the Moon, you'll recognize what I'm drawing here. So you, Newton had one prism. This is supposed to be an equilateral triangle. Just roll with it here. Um, and he came in fairly steep angle, so it come out relatively straight. But there was a dispersion of color um, going around this. So the reds weren't bending as strongly, and the blues were bending more strongly, like so. And then what he did was he put in a slit so that he could pick out one specific color. Like let's say this looks like probably some kind of shade of green we're going to have here. And he ran it through another prism. Again, that's supposed to be an equilateral triangle. Just work with it here. So it looks like we're picking out some shade of green here, probably in this example. And then what Newton observed was there's still just green light coming out. So this um, laid to rest the idea that you're somehow adding color to the light via the prism. Because if that were the case, you would expect red to blue to be still added across the screen or something like that. You'd expect to see some sort of spread of light, but he didn't see any spread of light. And so he was able from that to argue that white light was made of all the colors. But okay, why is it that we're not seeing all the color um, bend at the same angle? Um, it turns out that as a general rule of thumb that the index of refraction of a material is not a constant. Um, and that in fact, oops, sorry, that in the usual rule of thumb for it is if this is wavelength and this is index of refraction. At shorter wavelengths, the index of refraction is typically higher. Um, 
there are some weird materials that do weird things, but for almost all materials in wavelengths that you care about, um, this is a general rule of thumb, but the index of refraction will increase as the wavelength decreases, or say as the wavelength goes down, the index of refraction goes up. So if we think back to Snell's law, um, uh, n1 sine theta1 equals n2 sine theta2, um, if our wavelength increase, if our wavelength decreases, so this would be shifting to blue, to the blue end of the things. If our wavelength decreases, that means that our index of refraction would increase, which means that our um, angle would, our angle of refraction would decrease. So the way that I remember this, and it works in both directions, is blue bends better. Now, violet bends best, but that doesn't alliterate. So I remember blue bends better. What this means is that if the light is refracting toward the normal, blue light will more strongly refract toward the normal. And if it's refracting away from the normal, it will um, refract more strongly away from the normal. So whichever direction you're going, the blues will bend more dramatically than the reds. Okay. Now, why can't leave go? is one of the coolest applications of this that I can think of, and that's the rainbow. So if you're, so the usual way you see a rainbow, so here you are. Looking, looking at the rainbow, the sun is behind you. And you've got a rainstorm in front of you. Okay, when you look out at the uh, at, at over in the rain, you'll see a rainbow, and you see the reds on the top and the blues on the bottom. And I'll just put a couple more colors in between, say orange and yellow here, something like that. Well, we can put in green too, why not? So what's going on here? Well. Let's go into extreme close-up on a drop of water. We'll be back to our pretty picture in just a moment. Um, we can go ahead and model our drop of water as a sphere, and I am just going to apologize right now for just how terrible it's going to look. So let's say we have white light, oops, there we go. Let's say we have white light coming in, striking our raindrop like so. Okay, let's go ahead and strike a normal. So here's our normal. And now what will happen is the light will bend towards the normal, but the blues are going to do a better job of bending toward the normal than the reds.
Okay. Now it turns out that when you get to this other surface, that the light is dominantly going to reflect rather than refract. So, okay. Now, at each spot, you're going to have to strike a normal, and the normals will be pointed slightly differently. Oops. Dog on it. Something like that. And not like that. Something like I got that there. Oh crap! Had it. Ha. Okay. So what will happen here is at each spot we'll be following the angle, the, the, the law of reflection, and the red, and in doing so, the red and the blue rays will cross. And then they will refract out I'm not going to bother drawing in the normal this time. They'll refract out like so. So this combination of two refractions and one reflection um, turns out that the angle between the white light and the blue light is 40.8 degrees. And between the white light and the red light is 42.5 degrees. So then you say, hey, wait a minute. How is it then if the red light is coming out the bottom of the raindrop that I see the red on the top of the rainbow? And the answer is, that's where it needs to be in order for you to see that color. So here's what I mean by that. So, okay, good. So if I follow a ray of light from the sun coming in here, um, what we will get after our combination of ref reflections and refractions is the um, red light will make it to your eye but the blue light would have skipped out at a little shallower angle and missed over your eye. Whereas, say, down here, repeating another parallel ray from the sun, oops, the blue light will make it to your eye. But now the red light going through the bigger angle misses your eye low. So you wind up seeing red on the top and blue on the bottom. Now for the double rainbow what happens is that there is some more, not all the light that got refracted out not all the light gets refracted out here. There is some more reflection. If you follow around one more reflection and refraction, um, that will give you the light for the double rainbow. There will be, again, another crossing of red and blue light. Um, and so in the upper rainbow of a double rainbow, you will have the red on the bottom and the blue on the top. But most of the time, you only see the single rainbow because you, you need the light to be pretty strong to see the double. And by the way, it doesn't, there's nothing special about the red being on top. If the earth weren't in the way and the rain were still falling down, you would actually see this extend as a circle all the way around. In fact, uh, pilots flying aircraft at very high altitude, for instance, the old uh, Concorde supersonic transport that 
flew from uh, New York to Europe um, could fly at a high enough altitude that if it was raining in front of the ship and you could see form a rainbow, it wasn't a rainbow, it was a rain circle with the blues on the inside of the circle and the reds on the outside of the circle. Anyway, with that, have a good one, and I'll catch you on the flip side.